Hello and welcome to the podcast, Every Moment is Sacred, where we interweave meditation and healing into everyday life. I am your host, Rain Elizabeth Stickney. Now, let us begin. Hey, welcome back. Today, not only do I have a wonderful healing conversation to introduce to you, but I have someone here to help me introduce the show. Abby is with me. Hi, good to be here. What will we listen to today? What will we share with our audience? This is an episode with Donna. Yes, Donna Domino, and she's a dancer and in my opinion, a healer. And I will read to you a little bit about her from her bio because she puts everything so eloquently. So she has these wonderful programs called Living Body Awareness. And it's all about moving with your body's natural design and listening to all the ways the body speaks to the person. So my body speaks to me, her body speaks to her, and so on and so forth. And she's very skilled at helping people listen to their bodies. She says, wellness is more than being free from pain or illness. It is a process of change and growth toward greater health, vitality, freedom, and it is becoming even more of who you truly are. I'm so happy to share her wisdom with you. This episode is filled with inspiration to really know oneself better. And I feel inspired to imagine into how I can use what is around me to facilitate healing and growth even more potently. How is this sounding so far, Abby? Well, I love what you read from Donna's bio, and we just listened to a little clip of the episode, and I just feel so moved by how she is inspired by nature to feel into how her body wants to move and to develop a very like personal form of movement in that way that could then influence and inform other people to listen to how their bodies want to move. I think that's really a beautiful way to teach people to listen to themselves and to listen to nature. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I can't wait to listen. (laughs) You are going to love it. I mean, this is really one of those podcast episodes that People will want to listen to again and again and again. And I recommend that because there are so many nooks and crannies of sprouts of joy and wellness and even instruction in the most kind and gentle way. So Donna's background is vast and it includes not only dance, but also body alignment, energy movement, Tai Chi, Qigong, yoga, spirituality, embodied mysticism sound healing, empowerment coaching, body-centered meditation, theater, essential oils, and she finds her greatest teachers to be body and nature. She's worked with people between the ages of 12 and 95. She's customized programs. She is just a delight in the sense of witnessing a flower blooming and being awestruck with every petal that unfolds. She has a special offer for all of you who are listening, and that is that she would love to gift you a free living body awareness movement class. You can contact her by email, nobodyawareness, K-N-O-W, body awareness, nobodyawareness at yahoo.com. And her website is livingbodyawareness.com. We begin with gratitude. So I often ask this on the show, and you probably notice if you are a frequent listener that I ask people what they're grateful for. Now, Abby was the first guest on the show where I aired a conversation and Abby and I had a meditation journey. 
And we probably talked about gratitude in that episode as well. I can't imagine us not talking about gratitude. (laughs) So I have a gratitude practice that I offer, which is daily and through email. And you have an experience with that gratitude practice. I sure do. I love receiving your gratitudes and I kind of think of my gratitudes internally. I don't often share them, but that's how I do it. Mm -hmm. And everybody does it in their own way. Gratitude is personal and it's a treasure in the heart. I find that gratitude is life-changing and I recommend everyone have some sort of a gratitude practice that works for you. And if you want to practice gratitude with me, then please go to my website, rainelizabeth.org. I especially appreciate about your gratitudes that sometimes I feel like, oh yeah, like nothing is too small to be grateful for. A recent true story is the raspberries that we ate at the Trap Family Lodge. I had a raspberry seed stuck in one of my teeth for probably 24 hours. It was such a relief to get it out. I am grateful for getting that raspberry seed out of my tooth. I'm so grateful I didn't get any raspberry seeds. (laughs) Okay, as you can tell, we are having such a good time over here and we want you to have a good time too. So Abby just drew a card for us and for our community a goddess card. I sure did. Um, The goddess guidance oracle card that I drew is Irene and it's spelled E-I-R-E-E-N. And this card says peace. And it has a quote that says, there's no need to worry. Everything is working out beautifully. On that note, thank you, Abby Cajola, for being here to help introduce Donna Domino of Living Body Awareness. In this episode, you will gain information about listening to yourself, finding resources in surprising places, and you will discover what would have a four-year-old kicked out of dance class and how could this event be significant, meaningful, and crucial on the path of Donna's healing story. Hey, Donna. Hey, Rain. It's so wonderful to be here with you. Thank you so much. I am so excited to have this conversation with you, Rain. I know we've just known each other briefly on Facebook and, um, I just deeply resonate with so many of the things that you've shared. So I'm just really thrilled to be here. Good. I'm glad. I'm thrilled that you're here. And just to distinguish you from a previous Donna who was on the show, previously we had a guest named Donna Fields, and she, the fascinating soul living in Spain, and she did an intensive study of fairy tales. And so that's a great episode to listen to. But here you are Donna Domino. I am. And that's so funny because I know of Donna as well. And when we came together in a class, she, the first thing she wrote was, oh my God, there's another Donna. So yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yes. Yeah. Donna is a good name. I find your name to be very straightforward and kind. It comes across as kind to me, Donna. Oh, that's so interesting. I I was actually named after the song, Oh, Donna by Richie Valance, which isn't so kind. (laughs) Oh, that's so funny. (laughs) But that's, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. And I think in, um, in Italian, it it means beautiful lady. Mm. Yeah. Or lady. Yes. Yeah. Belladonna. So lady. Yes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, beautiful lady is very fitting for you. (laughs) Donna, what are you feeling grateful for today? Well, first of all, I so appreciate being here today, Kat. I appreciate being on this podcast with you, for sure. I am appreciating spring absolutely coming. I have, I think, felt more ready for that than I have in some time. So I'm very, very grateful for the aliveness and the beauty and um, the new growth that comes with that. And um, 
I have such a deep love for the body. And uh, I'm, it's funny, I had gotten a, an, um, read something on Facebook yesterday by a gentleman who I also resonate with. His name is Zach Bush, and he is a doctor of, of many things. And he is learning. He is learning from the earth how to allow the soil to come back to its original qualities mm-hmm. and how our body's ecosystem resonates so deeply with the earth. And so he's learning about the body. He's a three-time doctor. He's amazing in, in, in his work, but he's also an incredibly aware in my experience and spiritual, if you want to say that, very connected, very aware, very present. And so he is with other scientists learning from the earth about the body. That's how mm. he's learning, which to me is amazing. Mm. And so um, I'm, I'm very grateful for this and I'd love to share it as a little bit of, you know, my resonant with, with our body and, and just who we are as beings. So uh, just a paragraph here I'd love to, to share with everyone. Yeah, so Zach says that a hug is the solar event an extraordinary encounter of two energy fields intertwined together. And that when you hug someone, you are expanding yourself into the sunshine of another human being. Could that be any more miraculous? I just have chills. It just brings tears to my eyes. When you give someone a hug, we experience their sunlight filtered through their body's unique wavelength. In fact, the mitochondria in our respiratory chain liberates the sunlight inside of us at a rate of 10,000 times brighter per cubic cm than the surface of the sun. As a hug occurs, a cascade of neurotransmitter events happen throughout the body, such as the release of serotonin, dopamine, prolactin, and oxytocin especially if you hold on to that hug for anywhere from 15 seconds to one minute. Mm-hmm. Try giving someone a hug today and sense how they're feeling. At the very least, you'll share in the experience of each other's bodies emitting a massive flow of energy and witness a beautiful, spectacular spectrum of light. Amazing. I am just so blown away by who we are, just by our makeup. It, we just have, I have no idea, you know, as much as I, as I, you know, it just, I'm always amazed. I'm just always amazed. I mean, I don't know if you want to share anything or, or if that moved you as much as it moved me. I just, I just. Yes. I, I am also very touched by that passage. And what it reminds me of is long ago when I was teaching meditation in person in Berkeley, California, I had a regular Monday night group never missed. And if I did, I had somebody substitute for me. So it was a really nice mainstay and created a lovely community. They always knew they could go meditate on Mondays. And I would often hug people at the end just for fun, because it's what was true for us. And there was one, one lovely meditator who would come again and again. Her name is Jessica. And so we would hug. She was one of the people who was a hugging person. So we would hug after meditation. And somehow between us, we developed this phrase, I love hug. And it had to be that way because it's so simple. Not I love a hug. I want a hug. I love hugging you. It's all too complicated. It was just Mm. the basis, basic way of saying, I love hug. That's so pure. I love that. (laughs) I mean, I just, I'm just constantly amazed. I feel so grateful again and appreciative of the whatever the the work that I love the thing that resonates in me so deeply and you know it is the body and never quite know how to word it but I sometimes feel like a body advocate I feel that you know our bodies are truly a warrior for us just our greatest champion our greatest ally continually doing whatever they can to not only sustain us I think that's like their joyful purpose if we can make that connection. But also for me, they are an expression of our soul's messages Mm -hmm. and our body. I think bodies in general get a really bad rap and get blamed for being the messenger on so many levels. And, And when I read something like this, 
And I think what we're imbued with and what the body carries and the consciousness of that, I feel there is, you know, we the body has a consciousness on life. And um, if we can start to explore, you know, in whatever way feels resonant to each person, that that life, that consciousness, and maybe the way that we emanate this light, the sunlight, or whatever it is, and what is the consciousness of that? What does it feel like? How can how can we develop a relational connection like we would to perhaps a, a baby or a pet or a plant and start to really sense that silent language that the body is always, always wanting to share with us through how we feel or through giving us messages and guidance and nourishing. It just um, is the most fascinating thing to me. And um, my hope in my work is that people can not only begin to understand the design of the body, the natural design of the body, the natural alignment of the body, kind of like if we could understand the differences between men and women, or perhaps, you know, one child to the other, or a friend, if we can get to their true nature, then um, things can move more effortlessly, we can really support that, you know, and be a partnership, be in partnership with that. Mm -hmm. And so, for me, not only having people begin to learn about the body's natural design or natural alignment is a, just a wonderful foundation, and then begin to explore and begin to listen to the messages, you know, uh, that the body continues to give us. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I love that you are a lover of the body. I love how much you love the physical form. Yeah, it really makes me cry. I don't know. It just is something, you know, I I um I have since I was a child, I, I've loved to dance. And um and very much later on, through an interesting story of being kicked out of a dance school when I was four. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um and not wanting to, you know, take a class after that because I was just, you know, told I wasn't a serious dancer and um you know, and so I did my own thing. I, I created shows in my neighborhood and I danced in my basement and I always did choreography. I studied Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly and Bob Fosse, you know, whoever I could, you know, in the, in, on, in, in movies and film and um, and just would dance whenever I could. I, I had an uncle who was so great to me. And every Sunday when we went to my grandmother's, I would have a little dance and a song ready for him. <laughs> and I would ask, can you watch this Uncle Gary? <laughs> Before I go out and present it to everyone. <laughs> so um, I always had that kind of connection to the body and, and to the earth as well. Although, although to me, I think the earth was maybe both of them, but the earth was just always my family. I don't know even how to describe that. It was where I felt most at home. It was just something that I was able to speak to. I just always had a language to listen to nature and and hear it in some way. And, and that was my greatest friend. I think my favorite thing to do as a child was to lay underneath a huge blue spruce tree that I had in my yard. And, and that was my friend. <laughs> they were my friends and the daffodils. We had a lot of daffodils. And so it was just this incredible connection to the body and to the earth. And it was really the place I felt most comfortable and most free in uh, connection to more than anything. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. I like how you're relating the earth with family and the trees and the flowers and the body. I feel a unity between all of these elements as you're speaking. Yeah, I have felt rain um, as I um, moved into the work I do, which I'll I'll speak about. But that that nature has been my greatest teacher. I have never gotten certified. <laughs> uh, just recently, I I reached out, but I've always learned the most from nature about the body, and I've always learned the most in my work from listening to people's bodies and just really following whatever the body was sharing with me and just observing each person as an individual to whatever it was that was needed at that moment. And so as my work began to unfold, I began to just listen in new ways that I wasn't even quite aware of. And all of a sudden I would, you know, be shown where to go or what to do, or a download would come in or an idea. And I would just, you know, follow that and, and, 
I can't really describe it. It is sort of the body just sort of lights up, but it, it, I'm able to understand whatever it's communicating and, you know, just follow that call. And so I continue to, and I'm just fascinated. I continue to do my best to study and train in, in many different variety of things, so many things. And then uh, as I work with someone or listen or go out to the earth, I just allow myself not to know, mm. just allow everything to be whatever it is in that moment and be guided uh, by the body. How wise, mm. how wise to be able to step into the unknown and be willing to not know and allow something to happen. Yeah, um, it's taken it has taken some time, and I and that's one of the reasons why I enjoyed the, your conversation. The for everyone who hasn't heard Rain's conversation with Cat Caldwell Myers, mm-hmm. um, they were also speaking. Cat was saying, you know, something about you know how do we ever really know, you know, about how we do things and, and what we do, and it's it's taken me some time to gain confidence in trusting that un, unknowing and and really trusting the unseen. I think. Well, my life, I've kind of lived in the unseen world. Um, uh, I think you had said with Kat that it was the timeless world that you you lived in, something about time you had mentioned. And um, I've, I've just called it the unseen world because energy seems to be the place that I resonate so deeply and, you know, have an exchange with uh, very easily. And um, and so it's taken me some time to to allow myself not to know at the level of, you know, when somebody asks me, what do you do? I often... <laughs> often I often don't actually know what to say I can give maybe the results of what I do but I never quite know because it's always unique it's always different given Mm -hmm. given the moment and given whatever it is I'm given um, Mm -hmm. at that moment whatever guidance I'm given and so it's taken some time but it is for me it's just it's just just feels so incredibly true and it just feels like these moments of grace Mm -hmm. I feel very appreciative and blessed that I get to have, I feel whenever I work this flow of grace, you know, just guide me. So I love doing it. I just, I just find it hard to speak about sometimes. <laughs> well, that's okay. And that's so understandable because I hear how you live in the unseen world. And my understanding of that is that the unseen world, similar to the unknown and the timeless, there are no words there. And when there are words there, the words are not as important as what is unseen. If I could dance it for you, you know, because that's how it feels. It, it, mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a depth that I, yeah, yeah. So what on earth would have a four-year-old kicked out of a dance school? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> yeah, right. I know. <laughs> yeah, um, it's very interesting. So when uh, I would do my shows for my grandparents, um, you know, people would say, oh, you should go to dance school. You should go to dance school. And uh, my mother, you know, wanted me to go. And I know that whatever for, you know, whatever reasons, you know. So anyway, uh, my aunt um, asked my mother, could could her daughter come with me, my cousin, my cousin April. And um, and so my mother begrudgingly said yes. She didn't, for some reason, didn't really want that. But uh, it was interesting because when we went, you know, apparently, you know, I grew up on in Staten Island, New York, and um, this was, you know, I walked in and there was there was all these, you know, there were boys and girls, both boys and girls, and everybody was dressed in tights. And and my cousin, who was younger than me, uh, they didn't allow our parents to come in, and they closed the door, and they they needed to be outside. And so my cousin began crying. Mm. and um you know she was really scared and she wanted her mother and so I just asked her I from what I remember I I took her out I took her hand and I you know I just went over to help her and took her out Mm. and the teacher came outside and she said you know if you do that again you're going to have to leave and so you know my aunt and the teacher talked whatever to to my cousin and my mother and so my cousin came back in and um you know I was loving it we were we started dancing and then she started to cry again she wanted her mother again and I had a choice in that moment at four years old and you know I couldn't not help her Mm -hmm. so I took her out and the dance teacher came out and said I'm sorry but you can't come back because you're not serious dancers so my mother just got angry unfortunately and never said to me you know never talked to me about it beyond her own anger and um and so I 
I just felt it wasn't a place that I was welcome, you know, and mm -hmm. I, and I, I really took that in that I wasn't a serious dancer. And, um, and so that's how I got kicked out of dance school when I was four years old. Oh, and, and yeah. incredible and traumatic. I mean, I hear an act of compassion and love and, and friendship, even though there's a family relationship, but that friendship of wanting to help somebody that you love had, had nothing to do with dancing. Although I am gathering that your dancing these days and your dancing throughout your life is also an, an embodiment of compassion and love. Yeah, Rain. Thank you. So beautifully put. It's funny. I can usually tell the story without crying, but for some reason, uh, your, your response is bringing tears to my eyes. And I have to say that, you know, I am a gifted dancer. I, I started when I was 18. I finally did it. <laughs> <laughs> much, much later, right? And I had a dance company and and I just always knew that there's a flow of movement that comes through me that it just it's just very natural for me to dance. But I wondered, I've often wondered if I had become a dancer professionally in the sense that, you know, I went that way at a younger age. I don't know that I would have then created Living Body Awareness, which is the program I have now. I don't know that I would have come into this, this place of, of being able to help people you know, recover and heal and mend. And um, uh, my life might have went a very different way. And so years later, I can look back at that and say, yeah, very, very interesting how I stayed away from that. And it it allowed me to to go more deeply into my this inner world of the earth and the body in a whole different way. Um, because I really created my own world of dance. We had a basement that I lived in and then being outside and, and it was just always music and dance and um and so it was my own creations and kind of lost my train of thought there yeah um <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> my own creations and uh, I've seen myself back there dancing in the basement um <laughs> yeah as opposed to maybe being and I think I was very influential because I'm so sensitive to energy so sensitive mm -hmm. and so it you know it allowed me my own path I think rather than being mm -hmm. influenced by the dance world in another way mm -hmm. and that um and I think that really gave me a sensitivity like you're saying mm -hmm. and and um a greater sense of compassion and on a on a lot of different levels so mm -hmm. yeah so it's just amazing and just the truth of of this world I think that we um you know, everything is is happening for us. If we can, we can look towards that, you know. I think that is an excellent point, Donna, that if you were a four-year-old who was steeped in the dance world onward through 18 and beyond and into now, you would have likely been influenced by that dance world. However, life gave you a different path. And so you were able to be influenced by other things like your own natural wisdom, the teachings of nature, other things that you were drawn to. So now you have become very influential because your source is source rather than the world of dance. And yet you love to dance. And so source divine energy moving through you shows up as dance because naturally you are a dancer. It's so amazing. <laughs> I love that uh, rain. Yes. Yes. And, you know, it allowed me to, to develop this, this deep, deep relationship with my body because it was really a world that I created, you know, you know, and I guess as I'm talking with you, you know, as a child, it, it really was this, this flow of communication with my body and with nature. And I'm sure with, you know, some divine presence beyond that as well. That's quite beautifully the way you put it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that I developed this sort of, you know, connection to the body. What healing took place for you along your life path that has led to the work that you offer these days? Yeah, so um, a story I'd love to share that um, I hope that people can really question this and explore this, this possibility is that uh, in 2011, and I've had a lot of injuries in my life, a lot of accidents. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, I never really thought of myself that way until recently when I was working with someone because I was in a lot of pain and I, I had to um, share with them all these things that had happened to me in my life. And then when I looked at it, I said, oh my gosh, I've had a lot. I've had a lot of physical injuries. And in 2011, I had a, um, a breast diagnosis uh, I'll call it. And um, it was very, it was very, very interesting because um, I had had mammogram early on and 
I just didn't like it. I didn't like the way it felt. You know, it was fine when I got the results, but my body just didn't like it. And I didn't have another one after that. And I didn't plan on having another one because I just felt there were other ways, you know, I was very present with my body. I would listen to my body and I would, you know, very, very aware of my body if something was off. And um, I had a, um, a midwife as a gynecologist and um, she, when I went to see her, maybe um, 15 years after my first mammogram or something, I remember it was quite some time, she had just had a colleague who was diagnosed with breast cancer. And so she urged me to go and get a mammogram. And um, I really didn't want to. And I just had known her for quite some time. And she was so unsettled that I just said, okay, I'll do that. And uh, a, a friend of mine, um, her brother was um, uh, the head of radiology and worked with NYU and different things. And so we went to see him. She came with me and I had the mammogram and um, he then, uh, you know, took me into another room and he said, you know, we, we are seeing something here. And I was shocked. I said, okay, you know, that moment of shock. And um, he said, but I'll let you know, you know, and um, I went home and um, I was just about to leave for a retreat in Florida a woman that I had worked with on the phone, she was a um, shaman and a um, medical and spiritual intuitive. And I'd worked with her for a number of years. And it was the first time I was going to meet her. And I was going to one of her live retreats. And it was maybe the day before that I found that I found this out. And mm -hmm. he called me back and said, yeah, we are seeing something. And I'd like you to come in and get a um, biopsy. And so I... I said, okay, I can do that. And he explained to me what it was. And I went and um, they, they did find something. And he said, they also are seeing something else in the other breast. And he said, basically your options are to have a double mastectomy. And a lot of women, you know, choose that, or you can, you know, begin radiology, um, go, you know, begin radiation. And I said, there are no other options. And he said, not that I know of. And so what he said to me, it was, it was the, the diagnosis was DCIS and it was a zero stage. And I thought, well, what is that? And my friend who had taken me, whose brother was, was this doctor, she sent me something by Christian Northrop and it started to talk about mm -hmm. how, yeah, how this diagnosis hadn't come in until after mammograms were in place. And it just made me curious. And so I, I remember being in, in, the, um, in the room to go get tested again. And all these women were there and they had the television up with the news on. And I'm thinking, why? Why do they have the television up with the news on in a place like this? And all these women were sitting, you know, very vulnerable with these, whatever you call them that they give you at the hospital, you know, those robes, mm -hmm. those robes, yeah. very vulnerable, watching TV, watching the news. And out of there, there was coffee and donuts. And I just thought, it's not feeling right to me. There's got to be another way. There's got to be something else. And so I went to, back to see this gentleman and he was so kind. Um, and he felt terrible, of course, because he's my friend's brother, you know, and he was just, you know. And I said to him, I said, Dennis, I said, I, I really appreciate this, but my body's telling me I need to, I need to explore other options. And he said, well, I don't know any other options. And I started to explain to him that it felt like, you know, my body just didn't want to do this. And so he said to me, Donna, he actually said to me something like, I agree with you. I think there must be other things. He said, I just don't know them. And I, I said, yeah, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you, but I'm going to start exploring. And so I decided to um, go to this workshop. Uh, so I flew down from New York City to Florida. And um, in the workshop, the first day, there was a labyrinth that we walked. And I'd never been on a labyrinth before. And um, it was in a room, and it was a replica of shards, um, the labyrinth in shards, which is in France, which is often connected to the divine feminine in a lot of ways, and Mary Magdalene. And, um, and so the moment I walked into this, it was a building that just housed the labyrinth. And the moment I walked in there, I had tears. I didn't know why. It was in the evening. And um, to her credit, I, I believe um, the woman running, the woman I had worked with who was running the um, retreat, 
did not tell us what the labyrinth was or what it did. She just allowed us to walk it and to listen to what felt right. And so I, there was this beautiful music, this chanting music, and um, I was sitting and watching everyone walk and just crying, crying, crying. Didn't really know why. And so as I began, when it was when I felt called to go up, I walked up, and as I started to walk, I just started to dance. I don't know, it just moved me, and I just felt I was sort of dancing on the labyrinth, and and I just remember being moved, like physically being moved in some way, and that was my first experience. And um, and then we did other things, but I ended up staying a day later than the retreat. So on my own, I went back to the labyrinth, and there was no one there. And when I walked. When I began to walk the labyrinth, I felt as if someone took my hand. I felt as if, um, I know this is going to sound strange, but I felt a woman take my hand as a presence. And I felt as if a Black Panther took my other hand. And I had seen a Black Panther while I was in Florida. And apparently that in, the, in some of the indigenous cultures that represents the, the feminine, the divine feminine. And so... Um, I felt his presence, and as I was walking, I heard the words, you are already healed, but the process that you go through is very important. And I had a vision of a woman with red hair dancing sort of in a fire, and I didn't know a lot of, a lot of, a lot about um, women in religion or history. So for me, it felt like Mary Magdalene, I, and I, I don't know a lot of women in history, but that was a sense of feeling I had from my limited feeling. It felt like that kind of a presence. And um, I went home and lo and behold, about 15 minutes from my house was an outdoor labyrinth, which I had had no idea about. Wow. Yeah. And so I decided to walk that labyrinth every day for a year. And it was an outdoor labyrinth. So regardless of the weather, regardless of what was happening, I walked that labyrinth every day. And um, I did do a detox in a place in Ithaca that was very beneficial for me, um, a 12-day detox program. And um, I did work with a cranial sacral therapist. I did work with this, this shaman as well. But for the most part, I just listened. I went on that labyrinth and every day I got information and it was both personal and transpersonal and a story unfolded. It revealed to me a past life. It revealed to me um, just daily things about myself. And what was so fascinating was that this, this labyrinth was next, next door. It was at a church and right next door it was a playground. And so for me, it felt like the most joyful experience, the most joyful journey, like a playground for healing. And what I forgot to say was when I first had the diagnosis and after the shock mm -hmm. <laughs> and after just taking a moment to say, what is happening? <laughs> what? And letting myself feel that I decided to, to, I looked, I decided to ask, um, you know, I decided to look in Louise Hay's book and what, what the breast meant, what it meant. And it was about over nurturing. And so I asked the question, what is my responsibility here? Because I knew, I knew this is not the natural design of the body. It's not the natural design of the body to be ill in my experience. And if somehow I created this through whatever it was, through the way I was eating, through my environment, through my thoughts, whatever it was that I could then uncreate it. I could then create something else. And so I asked, what is my responsibility here? And I immediately got an answer. I thought that I had resolved this, this sort of overtaking care of um, my mom was somebody who had a lot of depression and, you know, I would come home and you know, specifically one time she, she was trying to kill herself. And, you know, she said that, you know, if I hadn't come home, it was because she knew I was going to be there that she didn't do it. But of course, you know, at that time and even younger, I had sort of just felt I was responsible for her. You know, it was just my job to take care of her and not have needs, basically, you know, it was, you know, that. And so um, I was, it was surprising to me that I still had this sort of over-responsibility for my parents at that time. And so I knew, 
I knew what I had done and what I had to uncreate. And Rain, at that moment, you know, there was just something in me that whatever fear I had went away because I felt, you know what, if I'm, if I just can't be free and be who I am and not feel that I'm overly responsible for people, I would rather die Mm. than not be free. And if I'm just going to live one week free, then I would rather have that than a life of not being free. And so at that moment, I had no fear. I just, just was this urgency to free myself to live without feeling that I couldn't nourish myself or, or have needs or that it was even safe to have needs or that I was just for the rest of my life responsible for other people's happiness. And so that was basically my journey. And on that labyrinth, in that I had a story that, again, was very personal, but then transpersonal. In the transpersonal story, I was apparently the head of a, in his past life, the head of some sort of a movement that I had begun that was sort of a soul calling for me. And uh, a group of women, and there was one man from what I what I've sensed. And at some point, all those people were killed. And I was left held prisoner, being held responsible, being told that it was my fault for following my calling, you know, that these people were killed. And um, that really was the beginning of my journey, along with the personal journey that I took, listened every day, followed that, did a lot of inner searching and writing. And um, after a year, I I went and I had uh, thermography, which I'd love for people to know about if they're not aware of. Mm-hmm. That thermography measures in such a dignified way the temperature of the body to see if there's any growths in the body. And it's a very, very beautiful, natural way to work. And it is an option in my experience for people who are looking for, you know, other ways to to check themselves and see how their body is doing. And so um, after a year, there was improvement. And I then continued on the labyrinth for another year and also walked into the sunrise every morning for a year um, oh, wow. at, the beach, at the beach and got a lot of doubts and a lot of stories about the feminine and masculine being reversed. <laughs> it's very, very fascinating. I hope to write about it at some point or at least share it on my podcast. And um, and after two years, I was completely cleared. So Amazing. Yes, you did Um, it. I did it. And uh, yes, and so that is my healing story and and my journey and how my work, how my work deepened so much to support people in doing whatever it is that feels right. I mean, I was open to radiation or mastectomy. I was open. But what I ask and what I hope to help people to explore or understand is just to take the time to listen to what truly feels right for you. And to me, the body is the messenger of that. And it's simple. It's what feels good and what doesn't feel good. What feels honest and what doesn't feel honest. How are you feeling? And um, that's what my work is, is the base of the work is about that we can to an understanding of the design of our body how our load-bearing joints actually work so that we can be so clear and and uh, use our energy more efficiently and feel good basically move out of pain but then to begin to really dive into knowing that relational connection with the body again like you would maybe a pet or a baby or um, nature and begin to develop that silent relationship. So you can clearly hear the messages that the body is giving us. And it can be so simple as to what honestly feels good and what honestly feels doesn't. And, and because we can hold traumas, the body sometimes will respond to the mind. And it, you know, you always want to check. But I think that, you know, once we we make that relational connection, it becomes, you know, my hope for people is that it just becomes easier and easier to to access that point. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, you know, my work is really um, deepened with the possibility with possibilities. You know, so much is possible. And I think when we can develop that relationship to ourselves, to our bodies, to our soul, however you want to think about it, uh, and begin to trust that, and begin to go there first, to begin to go inward before we move outward, 
to move inward before we take an action, then our choices will be more in alignment with who we truly are and what we truly want to create in our lives and in our world. And that's really the basis of the work that I hope to share that you know people can leave with. What a tremendous healing story you're sharing with us. Thank you so much. And I love how you listened and listened and listened and listened. And in the end, are able to attune to that silent conversation and help others to attune to that silent conversation. That is a beautiful and courageous skill. Thank you, Rain. Thank you. Thank you. It is courageous. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that moment of release of fear and moving onward. I felt such courage in that part of your journey. Yeah, I tell you, the the depth of freedom in that was just incredible. And again, you know, to have experienced that for the time I did, I think that time of that two years was one of the best, most joyful times of my life because of the presence, because of that. It, it has It hasn't uh, always been that easy since then, for sure. But that urgency did something for me that that brought me into that presence and built a muscle for me. And then, of course, other things happen in our lives and, you know, we're called to deeper places. But my delight, my my walk, my path is is that place of freedom, you know, in all the ways that I'm being called to it now, you know, whatever that is and to and to help others find that as well. Yeah. So how can people find you work-wise is your podcast out like share how people might discover more about you. Thank you, Rain. My podcast is not yet out. Um, it's so interesting. Um, and I am so ready for it, but uh, I've been moving through another yet difficult time. So uh, it is not yet out, but I'm hoping by the summertime that it will be, uh, and it will be called the playground for healing. Oh, so the playground steps back in. I was actually, I was wondering about that playground piece and I love play in general. So hey, tell us again, the name of your show. The playground for healing. Yeah. And I do see healing as a playground. Yeah. So that, you know, that will be out, but right now, and I, I am someone who I've had a program called living body awareness uh, that I started 19 years ago. And uh, it is, you know, back then it was about living in awareness through the body. Uh, Now they would call it embodiment. Um, uh, But for me, it was, you know, just making that connection to listen, you know, really movement by movement to how you felt and be guided by that. And so I have been offering movement classes, which I continue to offer. They are always unique to whatever the classes are. I, I get a sense of that. You know, I prepare, prepare all the time and then I let it go (laughs) and I move into that. I don't know, but it's often reflected to whatever, you know, to the people that are in the class, but they, they begin by moving inward in some way. Mm -hmm. Um, And then uh, often move into an intuitive sense of movement so that you can really begin to develop um, a sense of your own body and begin to trust her more and more or him. And, uh, and then I move into very nourishing movement, which is again, often different. It's fluid. It often, it often feels as if it calls in our own grace and we each get to connect to that. And, uh, and then I, there is often alignment work. And, you know, sometimes I just talk about body awareness and we practice that we practice the contrast of that. So we can really feel that and bring us into our daily lives. And then it moves into part of my, uh, my intention for the class is that that we each delight even more in who we are. So that is my hope as well. And so it moves into play, which can be dancing. It can be swinging the body, shaking the body, um, you, working with a rattle or a drum at times. It's, it's, it's always kind of unique. It can be toe tapping. It can be working with the brain in some way, but some sort of play. And then ending with some sort of a either a, a, an alignment work or stretching work or you know something to to learn more about the body and then into a deep rest and relaxation so that's sort of how the classes move beautiful um, very much aligned with my heart and soul i could see myself right there with you oh well you were you were welcome anytime right <laughs> yeah oh yeah um so um 
And then I also do uh, one on one sessions and um, I also do workshops. I do not have a workshop offer at the moment, but I will be uh, in the summertime offering workshops um, to do with cleansing the body through through the body itself, through some lymph work and alignment work and breath work and shaking and dance as well. And the one on one sessions really run the gamut. Um, the one-on-one sessions, mostly people come to me because they are in pain. They have some sort of an injury or they're not trusting their body and they're in their head a lot and they want to, you know, in some way work with the body more. And so I work as a, I am an empowerment coach, but I, I never really quite know what to call it, you know, sort of a conversational guidance and will work with the body. And a lot of times what I find um, is a beautiful way to come in is through alignment work because through alignment work, we have to be so present because we have to feel our way. We have to sense our way, listening to what muscles are compensating in our bodies, you know, what muscles, you know, what's being played there, you know, the awareness of how um, our bodies are moving from moment to moment. And I find that when we can do some very foundational alignment work, as well as working with the breath, uh, breathing into the diaphragm area, that it is an amazing way to connect back to ourselves. It is an amazing way to release trauma. It's an amazing way to really release, you know, tension held into the body and and the depth of that. And so that is often how clients come to me and we move in from there mm-hmm. and, and then whatever is needed. So I have a sense of being able to read programs and and um, uh, patterns and people. And so if needed, you know, we can go there. And sometimes I work with a client and within one session, they're fine. You know, I'll get in a hit where to work with them. It's very intuitive. Um, and I do body work as well. And since COVID, I've come online and I've learned to do energy work more <laughs> online as well. Uh, and then sometimes, you know, depending on what the person needs, I will recommend, you know, a longer program and depending on what they're wanting. So the one-on-one sessions really run the gamut, but it certainly works with becoming pain-free and learning the language of the body and then attuning to whatever personal needs that you have. And, you know, I customize the programs for each body. What gifts, what amazing gifts, Donna. And everyone listening, I want you to take her up on these gifts. You can tell <laughs> how how heartfelt she is. And I can tell as a body worker myself, I'm someone who's studied the expressive arts and authentic movement as a, a therapeutic dance practice. And so a lot of what you're saying, Donna, resonates with me through my own work. And I 100% feel the resonance of healing that moves through you that you are offering to the world. So everyone listening, find Donna, period. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. So, so, oh, that's so awesome, Rain. I've not heard of authentic movement. I'd like to know more. It's so funny when I'm working with somebody, people say, oh, you're doing this, you're doing reflexology, Uh you're doing tire, you're doing this, and you're doing cranial psychotherapy. I'm like, you know, and the woman that I worked with, the, uh, the, the shaman, she said, Donna, it seems to me, she said, if I was to guess that you sit, you just simply tap into the original source somehow mm-hmm. and it flows through. And, and that kind of makes sense to me because it, it feels like nature to me. You know, um, I don't know, really, I don't know, but it feels like that. But yeah, but I, um, you know, I've had this business for 19 years before COVID by word of mouth. Uh-huh. And so now, now being online. And so I'm learning um, just learning social media. So the best way to reach me is to go to my website at uh, livingbodyawareness.com or my email, which is uh, no body awareness in K-N-O-W, no body awareness to no body awareness. Um, and I am just coming up on Facebook and and somebody somebody from the group, our group said, Donna, you got to do it. And all I put was the website and I'm getting so many hits, but I have nothing else on there. So if you go there, there's not much there. I am on Instagram as highest outcome, but I, again, am just not active and I will be, but for now, email and my website are the places, you know, the best places to reach me. <laughs> okay. So Donna Domino, livingbodyawareness.com. And your email, say that one more time again. It's no body awareness at K-N-O-W. 
body awareness, like knowing I have a knowing no mm-hmm. body awareness. Yeah. At gmail.com uh, at, at, at yahoo.com. Thank oh, you. Oh, at Yahoo. Okay. Yahoo.com. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no body awareness at yahoo.com. K N O W. And I would like to say that, you know, for those of you that are following Rain or listening to her podcast, I'm so I'm so appreciative of her work. And for anyone who is following, I would like to offer um, a free class or a 20% discount off a private session for those that are listening to Rain's work. So yeah, mm. please feel free to reach out. Wonderful. Thank you for your generosity. And thank you so much for being here, Donna. It's just a pleasure, an immense pleasure to get to know you better. Thank you so much, Rain, and, and thank you for holding such a beautiful space. Um, I felt so, so held and um, just so easy to talk with you. What a joy. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. It has been a great joy to have your presence here in this podcast. I welcome you to celebrate the joy and wisdom in your life exactly as it is. And I welcome you to feel loved, fully loved, exactly as you are. www.rainelizabeth.org. <laughs>